Here we are at the third instrument I wanted to introduce today. This is the control panel of the Harvard cyclotron. Almost exactly as it stood the moment it was decommissioned in 2001. We couldn't, of course, save the cyclotron itself. Not only was it huge, filled with radioactive concrete and other toxic substances, but it was simply impossible to even imagine keeping a site that's so important for other purposes now in the biological sciences. But here we took the control panel. And in it, you can see a kind of material palimpsest of all the different epochs of physics at Harvard. The first cyclotron was built before World War II and was moved lock, stock, and barrel to Los Alamos to help make the atomic bomb. The government promised Harvard that after the hostilities ended that they rebuild a new and better cyclotron, and they did. This became the control panel for that apparatus. It was at the forefront of physics for a good long time. And it had its ups, extraordinary discoveries across many domains of nuclear and particle physics. And its downs, there was a huge explosion of a bubble chamber in 1965 that caused a fatality and several serious injuries. But here you can see switches and toggles and meters from the 1940s and 50s, oscilloscopes from the 60s and 70s, knickknacks that were used to cheer up the people that were working here. In fact, it's a kind of record of all the different technologies that went into running what was then high energy physics over a very long time. And when finally the cyclotron could no longer compete with much bigger instruments elsewhere, it became a crucial instrument for medical physics. Its proton beam could be focused down very finely to be able to treat, for instance, tumors of the eye or the brain without damaging healthy tissue nearby. So for a very long time, this was a crucial instrument in the scientific arsenal of Harvard. As we look towards the future of this collection, how we're going to think about these objects in a new context, we of course continue to acquire objects, especially instruments that are used in advanced scientific work here at the university. But it's also an opportunity to think about how a university will function with the collection and to put it to new uses. We constantly assemble teams of students, faculty, visitors, to think about each of our major changing exhibits. We did an interesting exhibit, for instance, on the history of the Rorschach test and how it emerged out of other forms of psychological testing and what roles it's played, the debates that have surrounded it. A very interesting show not long ago on the Turing test. This idea that Alan Turing had that if you could make a computer communicate with a human across a teletype, in a way that was indistinguishable for a human, that they were talking to a machine, not a person, well, then you would have achieved true artificial intelligence. We set up imitations of that imitation game, simulating the computers and programs of different epochs. And it was a tremendously exciting show. We even had a play written by Stephanie Dick, one of our graduate students here, who assembled the exchanges between people and machines, and between Turing and his parents, as a way of illustrating the complicated dynamics of communication. As we look towards the future, we'll have many other shows. We're planning one now on radio. We're thinking of others about radar and other things. It's very exciting to have this collection, these objects, that can be used not only to recall where Harvard has been in the past, but how to rethink the role of a museum, of material objects and knowledge as we look towards the future.